This podcast channel is about you, successful international entrepreneurs, successful expats, successful investors, sponsored by HCJ Contacts. Hello, good e- good afternoon, good evening, good morning, depending on which time zone you're in. Uh, welcome. Good to see you all. Thanks for joining us. So as you would have heard, this is actually being recorded. So if you don't want your yourself to appear on our video recording, uh, you're free to switch your cameras off. Uh, for those who would not have joined us before, our process and our procedure is pretty straightforward. Uh, I'll just talk for probably like 10 minutes on U.S. taxes in general. Uh, Damien will talk as well on the Ireland side of things. And then we will open up for Q&A because I know you guys came with lots of questions and, and we're anxious to hear what you have to say. So without further ado, I'm just going to share my screen. So is it share screen? And here we go. All right, let's talk a little bit about U.S. taxes. So as I mentioned, my name is Darren, and I'm a part of a a regional practice called Moore's Rule in Asia Pacific. I'm actually based in Singapore, officially. I'm not in Singapore right now. Uh, I'm actually in London right now. But uh, since 2013, I've been based in Singapore. And we're a member of Fusion International, which gives us access a lot of expertise and particularly within Europe, which is how I'm connected to Mr. Damien Malone, who is joining us this evening. Because I'm US qualified, you know how this goes. I'm legally required to tell you that nothing I say here should be construed as advice. I may be a tax consultant, but I'm not yet your tax consultant. So there is no advice. We get, you can treat this as education or entertainment, but should you wish to retain us uh, or anyone to help you do your taxes, you would need to enter into a legal arrangement with them. So social media, YouTube or live streams cannot be tax advice. And for, last but not least, nothing that I say here should be construed as encouraging you to pay less than your fair share of taxes in any jurisdiction in which you may be exposed. All right, that's how I stay out of trouble. And here it is in writing. So people ask me, you know, come on, I'm outside of the US. Who's going to catch me? The IRS has no time for me. So I normally flash these two gentlemen because these are two gentlemen who had the same thoughts. They thought that they're outside of the US. Nobody's going to come bothering them. They're too far away. But IRS agents found it within their, their, you know, their very busy schedule to jump on a plane and meet with them wearing a recording device. And one is out of jail and one is still in jail. So we can get into that later on, should that be of interest. But normally just flashing their pictures is enough to get your attention. So what I'm going to do is just give you a basic overview of your U.S. tax responsibilities should you find yourself outside of the US, for example, if you're in Ireland, uh, what your responsibilities would be as an expat. As you would no doubt be aware, the US practices citizenship-based taxation, which means it's almost impossible to break free of US taxes without either giving up your passport or green card. So that, that's basically the only way. I know there's a lot of misinformation online about once it's below 100K or once this or once that or once you go here, once you do this. For the most part, it's all unfortunately not true. It's fake news. You are tied to the US until you give up your passport and get a CLN, a Certificate of Loss and Nationality, or you give up your green card and you get an I-407, which is the State Department's way of saying we have received your green card, you're good to go. Unless you get one of those, you're still under the, the rule of the IRS. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you lose your green card, if your green card has expired, if your passport has expired, we've heard it all. The answer is still yes, you're within the US tax net. So then people ask, well, okay, 
if I'm in the US, I get a 1099, I get a W-2, I get K-1s. So I get copies and the IRS gets copies. So that's how they know what I'm up to. How do they know what I'm up to when I'm outside of the US? That's impossible, right? This is the answer, FATCA, the Financial Account Tax Compliance Act. Uh, contrary to popular opinion, it's not a tax. It's a framework for information exchange. So what the IRS has done since 2011, it has, uh, the US government has been empowered to enter into bilateral agreements with countries all over the world and countries that you would not expect to sign like China and Russia, they've all signed. So of course, Republic of Ireland has also signed. And what this means is that the Republic of Ireland has agreed to waive its local bank secrecy laws. So banks or financial institutions, not just banks, so financial institutions in general in Ireland are not legally required to go through their list of account holders and identify anyone that they suspect of being American. So even if they have an Irish passport, they have some other passport and they open an account under the other nationality, if the financial institution suspects that they may be US exposed and there are certain indices or flags that they look for. If there's a suspicion, even though the account holder denies it, they're legally required to report that person to the IRS. So that's this is the check and balance in the system. Uh, FATCA, information exchange, it's happening already. So we discussed more or less what is a U.S. person, obviously a U.S. passport or green card, but uh, quite common, especially within recent times, has been those that trigger what we call Section 7701, substantial presence, because of the health situation. I'm not allowed to say what it is, because otherwise we get uh, kicked off of certain platforms. So because of the health situation, and you know what I mean, travel has been severely disrupted. So people who did not intend to spend a lot of time in the US and they were counting their days. Uh, they ended up over, well, overstaying, not from an immigration perspective, but from a tax perspective. So by spending more than, it's 183 days, but the calculation is a bit convoluted. But the point is that they are in the US tax net because they spent more than they expected to in 2020 into 2021. Of course, they're accidental Americans. These are people who are born to at least one U.S. parent that is deemed to be taxed domicile in the U.S. And we can discuss that if it is of interest. Last but not least is would be those uh, a U.S. person who may have an Irish spouse and they can elect for that non-U.S. spouse to be treated as a U.S. taxpayer. That is an election that can be made. You may ask, that's crazy. Why would anybody do that? There are certain strategic advantages to doing that. If you are interested, we can talk about that a bit later. Responsibilities of a US person. So obviously uh, we're gonna talk about tax, but what is a bit perhaps counterintuitive is the idea that when it comes to international tax, the internal revenue service is less concerned about collecting revenue than it is about collecting data. Data is a new gold. So the forms that you need to fill out and submit that declare what your investments are overseas, including what your, what's in your bank account overseas, because that's reportable as well, we'll get into that. The penalties for not complying with those are actually higher than the penalties for not paying your taxes. So the Internal Revenue Service, the US government is big on information. In fact, for not reporting certain investments or uh, accounts, it could not just, it's not just civil penalties, but criminal as well. You can go to jail. So this is a nice acronym. At least I think it's cool that I've come up with to help you remember what your responsibilities are as a US person abroad. So we're asking you to do your best, B-E-S-T. B, bank accounts. And when I say bank, I also mean financial accounts, brokerage accounts, whatever. So bank accounts, remember I say I said criminal penalties apply for non-compliance. So B, report them. They don't normally factor into calculating your tax liability. It's simply a reporting requirement. No harm in telling them what you're up to. E, estimated taxes. Obviously, when you're in the US, you get paid on a W-2 and you're typically subject to withholding. When you're outside of the US, there would be no withholding, right? Because you're outside. So it's your responsibility to work with your preferred tax professional to work out what your estimated taxes would be 
and pay them in a timely fashion. They do four times a year, uh, quarterly payments. S, state taxes. Again, it comes as a surprise, just because you're not in your home state doesn't necessarily mean that you have no tax obligations to them. Because most states are domicile states, which mean that you have to take specific actions to sever your tax connection with those states. Some states are stickier than others, like Virginia and California. Uh, what we do is we work with clients to sever the residency with certain states and instead plan to flag in one of the nine states where there is no income tax, like your Texas or Florida or Alaska, Nevada, Tennessee, et cetera, right? So state tax issues, again, you think you're outside, what they're going to do to you. They just bide their time and they wait. And we've seen it time and time again. At some point in time, you will go back home. You will visit. You may return. And then they're waiting for you with a nice big tax bill. And we've seen it time and time again, unfortunately. T, transfer taxes. Also easy to forget if it is that you receive or you gift, you give uh, an asset or some of money to someone, even though they may not be a U.S. person, especially when they're not a U.S. person, that is reportable. Gifts are reportable. And of course, we help you with estate tax planning because unfortunately, it's a bit morbid, but it is something that one needs to consider because we also work with families who've loved a lost, uh, who's lost a loved one who uh, is U.S. exposed. And because they weren't planning ahead in terms of taxes, they've left their loved ones with a huge mess to, to wade through. And accounts are frozen and they can't get it. You know, kids and uh, dependent spouses can't get access to money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So tax planning uh, for estate taxes is something that we would advocate as well. Uh, just a few slides on the stimulus payments. Obviously, there were two last year and there have been one or two this year as well. The IRS has spent a lot of time and a lot of effort getting this uh, the stimulus payment section of their website up to date, the FAQs, and the you know the the ways of updating your your address or your bank account or, or whatever the case may be. So do spend some time on the IRS website, and most most times your information would already whatever question you may have in mind would already be answered there. Now. Many of our clients are high income earners. So then they ring me up or they WhatsApp me and say, well, like, where's my money? Where's my free money? And if, you, if it is that you are also on the higher income earning side of the spectrum, then bear in mind that these stimulus payments do have phase outs. So if you haven't got anything, it could be because your income is on the higher side. If you didn't get anything last year, work with whoever your chosen tax professional is uh, to do your returns because you can get a recovery rebate credit. So you will get a credit on your tax return if for whatever reason you did not get a check or you didn't get anything credited directly to your account. Okay. Uh, there's also a misunderstanding that people think, you know, um, I'm not earning that much money, right? So I don't need to file any US returns. Sometimes that is not exactly correct because the filing thresholds can be pretty low. So if, for example, you file separately, you can see that the filing threshold is actually $5. So if you made more than $5, the tax return is due. Now, Ireland is a relatively high tax jurisdiction. So often enough, people would not actually have a tax liability to the US, but that doesn't mean a tax return is not due. You still need to file a tax return, even though no taxes may be due. So we get a lot of questions, of course, about President Biden's tax plan. That's the point. It's still a plan. So nothing has been actually passed as yet. But having said that, Democrats do control both house, uh, both the House and the Senate. So I, one would imagine that most of what he expects or what he has planned will come to pass. For, for what it's worth, 
it's designed to target higher income earners. So it really kicks in for those who earn like 400K and above. Uh, that Then the they social security taxes as well as the marginal tax rates go up. It also would impact those who have corporate structures because right now uh, corporate taxes are pretty low, 21%. Uh, President Biden wants them pushed up to 28%. So you may want to look at your corporate structures. For those of you who are using offshore jurisdictions, like I do, there's, there was a guilty tax, a global intangible low tax income tax that was uh, um, brought in at the end of 2017 by former President Trump. The guilty tax is roughly around uh, like 10.5% or so. It's going to go up. So if you have a corporate structure using offshore jurisdictions, please keep that in mind. You might need to crunch some numbers to see whether it's worth doing some sort of re reorg or restructuring. What else? There's a lot of buzz around the child tax credits. From our understanding, it does not apply to Americans who reside outside of the US. So it'll be for people who are still uh, on US soil. So sorry about that. There are other bits and pieces, but I'll leave it there for now, but we can always pick it up in the Q&A. So I'm just gonna buzz through this for now. And that's it from my side. I'm gonna pass it on to Damien. And please, you can save your questions for the Q&A. You can put them in the box below and we pick it up then, Damien. Um, hi everybody. Uh, Damien Malone is my name. Um, I'm the managing partner and founder of Malone & Co. Um, we're a, an accountancy and tax practice um, with our headquarters in Dublin, and we've recently set up a second office in Nace in County Kildare. Um, so I suppose by Irish standards, we would probably be at this stage certainly considered a mid-tier practice. And obviously, as I say, we do a lot of tax work, both from a compliance perspective, which is obviously and submitting returns and so forth to the tax office and then also from an advisory perspective. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give an overview, I suppose, of tax in Ireland, uh, you know, for somebody who's coming to, um, to take up residence here or to live here, whether it be from the US or somewhere else and go through what I think are the important, um, what the important points that they need to be aware of and all of that. And um, so to make a start, just I suppose what exactly are the um, what exactly are the taxes in Ireland? So, from a personal perspective, so that would be income tax. And um, what's um, I suppose somewhat frustrating when you're living and, and and of course paying it in Ireland is that's really broken into three. As far as I would be concerned, we have PAY, which is pay as you earn. We have the USC, which is the universal social charge, and then we have PRSI, which is pay related social insurance. So all three are essentially a tax on income, they all work um, separately and independently of the other, but at the end of the at the end of the week or the end of the month or the end of the year, whatever the case may be, they all form part of the bill that you have to pay to the tax office. Um, as Darren mentioned, from at a corporate level, which we'll come to in a minute, it, Ireland is a very favorable jurisdiction, but for a, 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 person, a person that's living and working here, not so. And um, generally, once you get over a fairly modest and um, 35,000, if you're a single person, you, you, you're, you're looking at paying 50% plus um, in tax on every euro thereafter. Um, at the corporate level, and we would do a, a lot of work with international clients who um, set up companies in Ireland in order to obviously avail of the low tax rate here and, uh, and, and, and the other advantages of a corporate structure, which, um, you know, which appeals, um, I suppose, to many uh, international business person or investor. So we have obviously 12.5% um, headline rate. Um, we have a three-year startup exemption, uh, which I come to, or I have a few um, points on later in the in the slides. And again, we have some variance of that as well. For software and tech type companies, it is possible to get a 6.25% rate as well. Um, for passive income, which is essentially unearned income, say rents or income from investments, the corporation tax rate on that would be 25%. Capital gains tax is where you uh, make disposals of assets, whether it be shares or houses or currency or uh, whatever it is. Um, generally, the, the standard rate is 33%, but we do have um, variance of that as well. And we do have some important uh, or business relief um, 
business reliefs that, uh, that, 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 that are important in the Irish tax code that I'll mention later. Capital acquisitions tax is tax when you come into receipt of a gift or a, an inheritance, and that's currently at 33% um, as well. So depending on the point at which that kicks in um, is dependent on a number of factors, but generally it's based on who or the relationship you have with the, you know, with the individual who is giving you the gift or who has passed away and you're getting the inheritance from. VAT, value added tax, is a tax on consumers, so not a tax on business. So when you come over to live in Ireland or live in the EU, you'll pay value added tax on a lot of your day to day expenditure. And if you set up a business over here, you'll, you'll, you'll most likely have to register for value added tax and collect this tax on behalf of um, the tax authorities and pay it over. And um, stamp duty is a tax on um, documents as such. So if you come over and buy a, you know, buy a home to live in or buy a property over here, you pay stamp duty on, um, on the sale price and anything that's, I suppose, documented in a contract, stamp duty applies. Um, also on share sales and or share purchases um, and so forth. Local property tax was introduced maybe seven, eight, nine years ago when we were going through our um, our, 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 our um, tough economic times over here, and that's obviously a, a, a proper a tax that, that's on property based on a a, a notional market value. And uh, uh, again, for somebody that was coming to live in Ireland, if you did buy a, an expensive property over here, let's say a million euros plus, which some of our clients would have done, the property tax can be quite nasty on that. It actually can amount to a couple of thousand euros a year. And um, unfortunately, it is what it is. You have no real way, you, you have no real uh, way of avoiding that. So uh, to move on to what would determine uh, when a individual um, has potential exposure to pay tax in Ireland, and it's it's, it's really based on three um, three factors and three um, I suppose concepts that we have in tax law. So they they are obviously being tax resident, this concept of ordinarily residence, and then this concept of domicile. So you're a resident in Ireland for tax purposes if you spend more than 183 days on the ground here in a calendar year, or if you're here for between 280 days between the current year and the preceding year. So on average, that would be 140 days a year. So our, um, I suppose our clients who do have to manage their residence to avoid becoming tax resident in Ireland, it's generally 140 days a year is what they have to work toward to try and ensure that they're here for no more than that. Um, if it's a case an individual is satisfies the tax residence criteria in Ireland and in another jurisdiction. Generally, um, what determines where they end up being tax resident is, is based on the double tax treaty. And it, it you know, generally it's um, it, it, it comes down to factors such as like, where is their center of vital personal and economic interests and where is their, uh, you know, where have they a permanent home available to them? And again, we'd, a bit of planning needs to be done around that. If it's the case, an individual is going to satisfy um, you know, two jurisdictions, residence criteria, should they come and live in Ireland. The ordinarily resident um, concept, when you're resident in Ireland for three consecutive years, you automatically become this, um, you know, ordinarily resident here. And uh, th that's, just, uh, th that, that's just the way it is. It takes three years to lose that as well. Your domicile is really um, the country that you're born in. Or the you know the, the country that your for, your father is born in is generally where you you know where you know where your domicile is. It can be very difficult to change that, and really, if you do intend on changing that, um, you have to be there has to be very clear and you know very definitive steps um, taken as regards that. Like you really can't return to um, you know where it is you are you, you know you were originally domiciled. So. That leads on to, um, I suppose, the, my, my next slide, and again, the, the importance of the concept of domicile in Irish tax law, because for non-Irish domiciled people, so for any foreign individuals who come to take up residence in Ireland, they qualify for very, this, fa this very favourable treatment um, called a remittance basis of tax. So what that means is, is that generally they only pay tax in Ireland on their foreign income on what is remitted into Ireland. So they have um, quite a degree of control and scope over um, the extent of which their worldwide income will be exposed to tax in Ireland, which is the, the place they want to be, given how high personal tax rates are in Ireland. 
Um, generally as well, if you if you have a degree of wealth and you want to come and live in Ireland and uh, that wealth has been accumulated prior to taking up residence in Ireland, you can generally bring um, that in once it's clearly distinguishable that um, such wealth was generated long before or well before the time at which you, t you took up residence in Ireland. And again, we would do a fair bit of work around that for our overseas clients in helping them um, ensure that the, the you know the from a record keeping perspective that it's very clear um it's very clear uh you know where they're funding to you know fund their you know fund their living in Ireland and fund their relocation and all that that um doesn't fall within the scope of Irish tax. Same with foreign gains, foreign capital gains generally not taxable in Ireland um, until or uh, unless it's decided that they would be remitted into Ireland at such time when you are tax resident. Um, from uh, an inheritance tax perspective, um, slightly different in that if you are non-domiciled, um, in order to be within the remit of inheritance tax here, um, you have to be resident here for five consecutive years to fall within the, the scope of that. So that does give, um, that I suppose, does give some bit of flexibility and some bit of opportunity for planning. And um, the only proviso to that is as if the, um, if the, uh, the, the person who you've uh, received the inheritance from is in themselves resident in Ireland at the date of their or ordinarily resident, or if what you've received is actually Irish situate property, which is really land and buildings um, that, are, um, that are underground in Ireland, if the value comes from that. Um, in Ireland, how we uh, uh, do our filings and pay our tax. So from an income tax perspective, when you come over and um, generally at the end of the year, you file a, a return called a Form 11. That generally is done no later than October each year. So in October 2021, you would be filing your tax return for the 2020 year. So we are some uh, way behind, I suppose, the actual payment of tax as to when it is um, as to when it is generated. From a corporation tax perspective, where if you set up a company in Ireland to obviously avail of the lower corporate tax rate, um, the, you generally have a degree of discretion over uh, you know, what year end date you would choose and you pay your, or you file your corporation tax return on the 23rd day of the ninth month um, following the end of your financial period. And as I say, you do have discretion with that. For both income tax and corporation tax, we have a preliminary tax regime where you do, after your first year of um, filing, you do have to pay um, essentially on account which is generally based on what you paid the, the prior year. So you make a payment on account by a certain date for both income tax and corporation tax. And then when you do the actual filing, you do a calculation to see what the liability is and you take away the preliminary tax that you've paid and you'll either have to pay a balance or get a refund of the difference. For if you set up a business in Ireland and you have to uh, register for uh, VAT, um, generally, that will be bi-monthly when you start. So if you set up a business on the 1st of July 2021, your first VAT return would be for July, August 2021, and you would file that in September. Um, it can be pushed out to four monthly or six monthly or even annually as the business gets established and the uh, extent of the liabilities are ascertained. The tax office give a concession. Um, if you employ staff in Ireland or if you... Um, are employed in Ireland yourself, um, you obviously, there'll, there'll be a payroll that will be operated, whether it be weekly, fortnightly or monthly. Um, it, uh, the, it's all done in, in, in live time now in Ireland under what we call PAY modernization. So when anybody, when an employer or director is going to take payment from their company, um, what happens is that the agents like ourselves would sync our payroll software with the tax office software and it tells us what a person's tax allowances and so forth are to use in the calculations. We do the calculations, we uh, give a pay slip and we, we, we file a submission with the tax office for the tax that's due there and then. So it, it, it's done on a live basis and has been so for the last two years or, or, or that since the introduction of the, the PAY modernization. We do have a fairly heavy penal regime if you are late. So if you're, if you're late with income tax or corporation tax, you pay a, a flat surcharge that's either 5% or 10%, and there's very little discretion over that if you're late. And there's also interest, which is statutory, uh, works out at about 9% per annum. And um, for more, I suppose, significant um, 
for more significant um, breaches or issues that may occur, um, that there are higher penalties for that, and particularly if you if you if you come under um, audit or investigation with the tax office over here, they can amount up very quickly, and it, of course it can also amount to. Um, a possible publication in our national newspapers when the liabilities go over a certain level, if you're unfortunate enough to um, come under their focus and um, they audit you. We've mentioned social security, which is um, PRSI, pay-related social insurance in Ireland. Um, so I have a slide here on that, and really there's two categories of that. One is when you're an employer, um, you have to pay employer PRSI on staff wages, and that's between um, just over eight and a half percent, and I think it's ten point nine percent. So there's two rates of it. I think when you go over three hundred and seventy something euros a week gross, you kick in if you're an employer to the near eleven percent rate. So it is quite a um, a significant burden if you're an employer. For an for an employee, it's generally four percent of what your gross salary are, or if you're self-employed with. Um, Obviously, um, self-employed income or investment income, it's generally 4% on, um, on that figure. So uh, if you're in, in employment, those deductions are made at source through the payroll. If you're self-employed, you pay it annually on your Form 11. Um, the, 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 we have different classes of social insurance, the main ones being um, Class A and Class S. Class A is generally where you're an employee or where you're working in a business that you're not the owner or you don't own at least 50% of the business. Class S is where you are actually the, the, the owner or a 50% or more shareholder in, in, in a business. And without getting into, um, I suppose, what they entitle you to or the full extent of what they entitle you to, generally, um, if you're Class A, you will get, obviously, um, job seekers benefit if you lose, if you lose your work or you're out of work state pension which is a big one we do have quite a you know a relatively generous state pension provision in for um, for our um, citizens and our residents which generally comes to about 260 euros a week once you have enough insu uh, insurance contrib uh, contributions made whether to be a class a or class s um, some of the differences between the two if you're self-employed you actually don't get illness benefit carers benefit injuries benefit or health and safety benefits. So they're just a couple of the, um, even though you pay more or less the same am amount yourself personally, you, it, it, there, there, there is a, some degree of discrimination in the system um, uh, for our self-employed people in Ireland. So just to, to wrap up my end, a couple of other points that I would, um, I, I would flag uh, uh, that may be of some relevance. First is SARP relief, which is the special assignee relief. Um, uh, or the special assignment relief program, whereby if you are a high, uh, well, a relatively high paid person that's coming to work for an Irish company, um, you can avail of this relief where um, a certain part of your income over um, 70,000 per year um, is exempted from, um, from the charge to tax in Ireland. So I think at the, at, the, at, at the highest level, the relief goes up to a salary of half a million a year, and that would potentially save I think it's in the region of about a hundred thousand in tax on that. So it is quite, um, it is quite advantageous and of some significance if you are coming to work in Ireland and take up a relatively high level position. And um, from a corporation tax perspective, if you come over and start up a new business in Ireland and employ staff, um, you qualify for this three-year corporation tax exemption, where you may not have to pay any corporation tax at all on your profits up to um, up to certain levels for each of the first three years. We have BIK, which is benefit in kind. So this is quite nasty. Um, and this is where if you are, whether employed or self-employed, if, if your employer or your company is paying benefits on your behalf, uh, it's most likely going to get caught within these provisions. So whether they, you provide a car, whether it's medical insurance, whether you provide um, residential accommodation to live in, all of these trigger a charge to benefit in kind and it's something to be wary of. Um, pension contribution relief is something that is worth something of some significance in the Irish tax um, in the Irish tax code. Um, this can come uh, in a personal capacity where you're making the contributions yourself and you get tax relief and get um, you can get tax back on the contributions that you make depending on um, a, a number of factors such as your salary and your age um, that will sort of dictate how much or what level of scope you have to 
um, I suppose, to put a, a to, to put as much as you can away into your pension pot. Um, if you are a company director, um, it's even more advantageous because your company can fund um, quite significant amounts and get a tax deduction for it in his books to, to you know to build up quite a um, a valuable pension pot. As I say, if you if you come over and set up a business in Ireland and you are a director and shareholder. We have two very generous um, business sale reliefs that are called entrepreneurial relief and retirement relief. Um, and what these are, entrepreneurial relief is when you sell a company, when you sell a company shares, it, 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 you pay only 10% on the value of those shares up to a million euros and um, subject to some terms and conditions. Retirement relief works similarly, even though you can do it, you don't have to be an incorporated um, entity for that. Um, slightly more advantageous in that there's no tax at all, up to um, three quarters of a million. Again, subject to terms and conditions. I suppose for maybe more valuable, bigger businesses, say um, the likes of say software businesses, again, that tend to get sold for many multiples of their earnings, or if there's no earnings can still be sold for very significant sums based on their perceived value and their technology value and so forth, we have a very um, advantageous holding company structure in Ireland, whereby if you set up a company to hold the shares in your in, in your trading company, again, subject to some fairly um, straightforward and easy conditions to satisfy, you can sell your business and not pay any tax at all, albeit that the, the funding will stay in the, um, will stay in the, the, the holding company and is not per se in your bank account. Um, so I suppose some food for thought in all of that and I'm um, happy to um, answer any questions or share my thoughts on any, um, on any um, topics or points that you may have with Darren here now in the questions and answers um, session. And thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you very much, Damien, for that. So we do have some questions. I'm going to ask them in the order in which we receive them. I'm going to read them out because there are people on other platforms who may not be able to see Zoom. So the first one, ooh, my screen moved, is, right. I'm, uh, Alex is asking, I'm an American, came over to Ireland. I have had a civil union, upgraded to marriage. I do not work and I filed jointly in Ireland with my husband. What could be my liabilities? I'm just going to touch a little bit on the American part, although I know that she really wants to jump into the uh, Ireland part. So even though you're not working, if you have any income at all, like investment income, just please bear in mind that there may be U.S. tax responsibilities to that. And if you have bank accounts, or even if you hold financial accounts jointly with your partner in Ireland, there may be uh, U.S. reporting requirements. If there've been any exchange of assets back or forth, including cash, that may be reportable as well. And with that, over to you, Damien. Yeah, so if it's a case there's no, you, you've no taxable income at all, yeah, you would, you've done the right thing and um, be jointly assessed with your spouse because the advantage of that is, is um, he can get an extra, he can get extra tax allowances, namely the tax credit and our tax cut off point here, which will save him tax on his salary. If it's a case he is self-employed, maybe drop me a line because you, 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 even though he may get the benefit of the extra allowances, you might be missing a trick with just, I suppose, maximizing what you can do with the, um, I suppose, with the surplus business profit there. And um, obviously, um, from your own point of view as well, um, allowing for pension provisioning and so forth, if he's in a position to employ you in his business, that could be advantageous and could be something to look at. So happy to do a follow-up email or call to tease that out a bit further. Um, with, the, with the person who asked the question if they want. Okay, wonderful. Uh, moving on, Rick is asking, Rick is saying, I've been living in Ireland for over 20 years and learn about US citizens having to pay file taxes back in the US. I'm married with two kids. How can I start filing now and will I incur a huge penalty? Uh, Rick, you're not alone. And because so many people living outside of the US are not aware of their US tax responsibilities, the IRS has a program, which is an amnesty in all but name, called the Streamline Compliance Procedure. So just to, it's, to briefly explain what it entails, 
the look back period is three years. So even though you may not have filed for 20 years, right? You, the look back period is three years. So you look at the last three years, which the due date has already passed, which in this case will be 20, 19, and 18. Everything before that doesn't matter. Just the last three years, which the due date has already passed. And that's driven by the statute of limitation. And then similarly with the foreign bank account report, because as I mentioned, you do need to report uh, foreign financial accounts. The look back period for that would be six years, which the due date has already passed. So 2020 back six years. So you pull that together. We help you work through the foreign bank account report. We help you pull together your tax returns and you submit them uh, with a, a cover letter, which explains why you have been non-compliant. And of course you agree to be compliant going forward. And once you are deemed to be non willful which it appears uh, that you, you may indeed be the case for you, then you're, you're good and you, you're free and clear. And of course, going forward, you file in, in the normal fashion as a, a normal tax return. So the streamlined compliance procedure may be what is right for you. So please reach out to, to ourselves uh, uh, whenever you're ready to take that forward. So I'm gonna move on to the next one. My, uh, so Carrie, I think is asking, my wife is American, I am Irish. If we come home to retire, we would be pulling from U.S. retirement savings, Social Security, et cetera. If we put that in Irish bank, uh, we're going to be taxed again. Oh, we only need to worry about the money earned in Ireland. Uh, Damien? So it, I suppose it depends on when it's drawn down, doesn't it? Out of the U.S. Out of the US pension account. And if it's drawn down at such time when they are resident in Ireland, then it definitely needs to be looked at. Um, it, it definitely needs to be looked at because I think it will be considered income. Um, but I suppose that the, the way or the, the, are, are, are the easy sort of what, what I'm thinking, the easy answer for that is, is if let's say they wanted to come to take up residence in Ireland next year, is just draw it down in this year. And that way it should be OK. They're not going to be exposed to income tax in Ireland on it next year. So again, um, I suppose like with um, the answer to, a, a, I suppose, a fair, um, fair amount of questions such as this is just get the steps and get the timing of it right and there shouldn't be any problem. Um, so that would, be, that, that would be what I'm thinking on that one. Okay, great. So, so Jamie, we'll can, I just, can I just ask a follow-up? I'm sorry. So if, if we, we drew down, say, monthly, after we were there, I mean, we're not going to pull all of our money out at once, right? So if we were once, pulling yeah, yeah. monthly or yeah. annually to support ourselves in Ireland, that would be you, considered income. Yes, and Carrie, you, 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 in, in that scenario, you definitely would be, it definitely would be liable to go on your tax return in Ireland. Um, how that or what that would equate to in actual uh, hard cash for you on an annual basis like would, would really be dependent upon your circumstances if there is any I don't know would there be any tax at the, on, on, on it at the US end if there was there may be some double tax relief that you could avail of um, so I suppose we'd, you, you, we'd have to look at the uh, do an estimate of what your um, what your total anticipated earnings would be um, in a year in Ireland and, and sort of give you a bit of guidance from that, like so you could um, assess how um, how you'd feel about what the tax exposure in Ireland would be. But yeah, I, I'm fairly sure it would be caught in Ireland because you're it's it would be it would be classed as income. Okay, well we'll give you a call, Damien, because yeah. uh, you can bet we will be taxed when we pull it out here. So um, yeah. if we're over there, we'll just we'll give you a call so we can narrow that down. Thank you so yeah, much. Like just remember, Carrie, like. Could it be an option to look at? And again, it all depends on, on, on how much capital you have or you know, like what your, your, your fund provisioning is. But if there was enough in it like that, you could draw down a certain percentage of it and you were, you, you know, you were quite comfortable with what was there in the remainder. Um, you know, you could, I suppose, take a lump sum out in the year before you arrive or before you take up residence here and use that to fund yourselves for a couple of years. Like that might be one way to, um, it, it all depends on what the numbers are and what the, you know what you know what level of pension provisioning you have so i suppose we can have a chat about that at some stage great thank you damien appreciate it and just to add to what damien has said and for people who may be in similar situations 
uh, there is both countries recognize foreign tax credits. So in addition to which there's a tax treaty in play. So it's very unlikely that you'd be taxed twice in the same income because we'd be able to leverage tax credits and or the treaty itself. So with that in mind, I'm going to move on to Alex. Sorry, someone said someone asked a question. No, okay. Moving on. Alex has asked, if I take retirement to be paid in Ireland, what are my responsibilities? And can I then declare him as my dependent? I guess your partner as your dependent. Uh, Damien? Sorry, Darren, just say that again there because my, 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 my Zoom just froze just as you were starting. Okay, no problem. So Alice has a follow-up question. He's asking, if I take early retirement to be paid in Ireland, what are my responsibilities? And can I then declare my partner as my dependent? So is this, is, is Alex currently a US resident that's thinking of coming to Ireland to take early retirement? Uh, and Alex, do you want to mute and clarify, please? No, um, my partner and I came back when civil union came into effect, which it yeah. was not recognized in the States. He's been working, okay, I've been his dependent. But now I've passed my 60 years of age. I'm entitled to, if I want to take early retirement from the States, which I have all my credits done, fulfilled many times over. If I take that, then can I declare him if he's not working as a dependent of mine? And this is, well, well first of all, like you have to, to qualify for the state pension, the age is now, it's 66, isn't it? So you're not going to qualify for that, Alex, will you? No, no. Like I'm, I'm, have I'm already, I'm, I'm under American law, if, the way I understand it, I fulfilled my 40 credits and then some. Okay, so I'm entitled so, to uh, retirement from the U.S. Okay, I'm so it's a U.S. Yeah. Okay, I'm, it's, I'm it's, also it's, past 60, so I can yeah. now ask for an early retirement, taking a certain percentage off. At that okay. stage, he can stop working. Yeah. Can I declare him as a, as as a dependent of mine there or here? I don't see any advantage at this point in Ireland with that. I think the advantage might come where when you are the retirement age in Ireland, which is the, the 66, I think you might have entitlement to an additional pension then if you have a dependent at that point. But I don't see... I'm not aware of any, you know, of any benefit you could get on the Irish side now, Alex, when you're 60. No, I'm talking about the American side because I'm still an American citizen. Yeah, okay. My yeah. pension from America. So the pension he's talking about will be coming from America, not Ireland. Yeah. Okay. So, Darren, do you know, um, do you know anything about how the 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 the, the, the U.S. state pensions work in that regard with dependents? To to put it into context. Right mm -hmm. now, I'm living here. I'm not working. He's my dependent. I'm his dependent. He gets a tax credit for me. I get my pension from the states. Okay, I receive it here, but he's now my dependent. Do I get a tax credit in the states for that, or does it have to be worked out here? Hmm. We so the the whole system of getting exemptions uh, for for partners and, and for dependent kids or even the parent parents or whatever was kind of thrown up in the air under the Tax Cut and Jobs Act at the end of 2017. So there are no more exemptions uh, in the first place. So yeah, so the answer at this point in time, unless things change, uh, there are no dependent exemptions at this point, generally speaking, from a US perspective. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Got it, okay, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Okay, sorry, there's another question. Good to, know, good to know, Darren. This is from Carrie again. Is there a limit on that income tax credit? Meaning, could we only shield a certain amount from double tax? Uh, it really, so I guess we, we, we're talking about uh, between Ireland and the US, a double, uh, the double tax agreement. It really depends. It really depends. It's, it's hard to, to, to speak too generally, but the, the, what I want you to, to, to take away is that it's unlikely that you'll be taxed on the same income twice. 
chances are you'll just be paying the higher of whichever one it is. If Ireland's going to be higher, you're going to pay that. It's unlikely the U.S. is going to be higher. So, you know, it's not yeah. going to be taxed twice. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that, that's a good answer, Darren. It, it, it's likely you'll, pay, you'll end up paying whichever is the higher, and that's probably the best way to look at it. Yeah. Ah, so, okay. So, yeah, that could make a difference. If we were taking out, let's pick a number, 100000 a year, 200000 whatever it is, um, we may end up paying 50% on that if we're living in Ireland. Well, you, you pay 50% on some of it, Carrie. And this is, what I was, this is what I was kind of touching at. The way I'd be trying to angle this is I'd be trying to project out your, um, you know, what, what, what your income is likely to be in such a way that you'll pay or you'll have enough up to your cutoff point, whatever that may be. So you're only going to be exposing your income up to 20% PAY plus USC and plus PRSI. And how you then, I suppose, survive, for want of a better way to put it, is you allow for that through your capital, you know, through what existing capital and wealth that you have. So we try and work out and project how you could optimize your, um, your you know, your, 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 your finances with that in mind, if that makes sense. Okay, I, I don't exactly understand, but okay, I won't drag everyone through this. Yeah, if you can, yeah, if you if you can, if if you if you're in the position where you can extract, um, whatever percentage of your wealth now that is not being exposed when you bring it into Ireland, and then plan whatever income you're going to generate thereafter, whether it be from work or pensions or whatever, to bring it as close as you can to the the cutoff point in Ireland, which is the point at which you go from the the lower rate to the higher rate. And, and whatever that figure is, you use that and your pre um, your pre residence capital to maintain and provide for yourself in Ireland, and that's how I think you would go about optimizing your your tax affairs. Okay. Sorry, so, sorry if that <laughs> if I've lost you on that and it's not clear. <laughs> <laughs> I think I understand. Yes. Yeah. But I think it's worth a call. So thank you so much. We'll we'll contact you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question. The, you mentioned, Damien, the remittance basis. So can someone who is a dual citizen, so US, Ireland, they, they move to Ireland, can they qualify for being taxed on the remittance basis? And if so, what is the process for registering? If they're a dual citizen, uh, good question. I where would they be considered domicile, I suppose? So I, I think we'd probably get into the case law, the case law on that, and um, where do they see their, you know, where do they see their, uh, like their real home to be? Is it actually Ireland and is it, or is it, the, is it America? If it's the case, it's America, then yes, they will qualify for the, um, you know, for the remittance basis. But if it's a case, it's, it's, it's not, it's Ireland, they, they wouldn't. That would be my answer to that. And obviously we could have a look and see, we could maybe share with them the kind of factors that have been, that we, we, we know that the, the courts have looked at before to make an assessment like that, like. Um, it's a good question, yeah. Mm, okay. Uh, another question that I've been personally getting a lot of as well, crypto. How does the Republic of Ireland view crypto? Yeah, there's quite a lot of that floating around. And of course, there's quite a lot of people in Ireland that probably aren't in any way um, experienced in business that decided to put their life savings into crypto and mm -hmm. um, have turned whatever their life savings was into a multiple of where it is and now realize. So it's, it, 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 what, what the tax office in Ireland says is it's really the same as trading in any currency. So in most mm -hmm. cases, it'll be liable to capital gains tax. The gains on it. It is yeah. viewed as a currency in Ireland. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's yeah. Good to know. yeah. 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 Right. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Rick, yes, you, you can. Uh, so Rick is asking about uh, the streamlined compliance procedure. You can reach out to, to me directly. And what Hannah will do, she will type our email address in the chat box below. Okay. Uh, another question for you, Damien. The three-year corporate relief, how does someone qualify for that? Or is it just by incorporating an entity in Ireland? You so it's by, incorporating a, by, by, by incorporating an entity and carrying on a qualifying trade 
and right. most businesses are a qualifying trade bar a few exceptions such as professional services so poor accountants and lawyers and so forth they wouldn't qualify and um, but it's really any anything else really aside from the excluded activities that's there which are only a handful and the key to it is you have to employ staff so when you employ staff and you pay employers PRSI the employers PRSI you pay that gets credited against your corporation tax bill so it, it, it is very much linked to employment generation but it is quite it, it, it is quite generous you can shelter or you can shield almost a million euro in profit without paying any corporation tax on it if you do employ enough staff and all of that. So, um, again, say the likes of um, hospitality businesses and and that that would have um, you know that would have a um, you know fairly high uh, payroll cost in comparison to their turnover. The likes of those would, would you know would benefit ver- you know very very well from it. And it's a self-assessed like like anything in Ireland. It's a self-assessed process. So your accountant at the end of the year, if you qualify for it, just makes a declaration on the corporation tax return, and that's it. Mm-hmm. Okay, wonderful. Uh, any other questions? Anyone? So I'm just going to have a quick look on the other screens just in case anyone on Facebook asking. Uh, nope. Okay. So I think that's it. Damien, thank you for your time sharing your your expertise with us here this evening. And everyone, thank you for joining. And please feel free to reach out to Damien and or myself, and we'll definitely look after you. Have a good evening. Here are four ways we can help you. Number one, sign up for free webinars on U.S. Expat Taxes and International Entrepreneur Taxes at www.htj.tax. Number two, stream premium educational videos at www.hcj.tax. Number three, contact us for tax optimization consult over Zoom. Number four, high net worth. We can quote for doing your U.S. international taxes returns. Our books and upcoming events are available at htj.tax. Please subscribe, like, share and comment below email us at help at htj.tax to engage us to advise on international tax or business matters